Welcome to the third Sunday in Lent. It's great to have you with us today. Today our theme again and again is again and again God shows us the way and we explore um, the way that Jesus is showing us what might be a little bit different to how we might think the way might look like. Yay! Celebration time. Happy birthday this week to Debbie and to Robin Clerk. And yesterday Keith Hay had his birthday. And next week we will be remembering Margaret Rokard and Trevor McCracken's birthdays. So congratulations everyone. Happy birthday. Hope you have a nice day. And if you can, you can get to spend some time with the people you love. Again and again. We, we come, come to our worship space. Again and again. We, we gather apart as a community. Again and again. We, we move closer to God. Again and again. God, God is here. We are men. We are heard. We are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship holy God.
This is a table. It's not a particularly big table and it holds the things that I have been told are important. It holds my wallet. This represents the world telling me that earning money is the most important thing that I can do. It tells me that how much I get paid is how much I'm worth. It does not see the sacrifice of parenthood, the value of wisdom in retirement, the energy of in or insights of childhood, the importance of volunteering, the value of being present. This is a singlet. It's comfortable in the summer when it's hot and sticky, but I've also been told that as a woman I shouldn't wear it because of what other men might think. This is my Bible. This Bible has beauty and truth in its pages, but has been used to justify racism, slavery, genocide, and to stop people fulfilling their calling of God due to their gender, culture, or sexual orientation. This is the New Zealand prayer book. There is spiritual guidance and inspiration within these pages but I've also been told that the only acceptable worship has to come from here and to do otherwise is wrong. This is a report that tells me that Māori children are more likely to grow up in poverty and what we can do about it. But other people have told me that the reason why Māori live in poverty is because they are different that they don't listen to white people or because they are lazy when actually it is because of the color of their skin and that we don't value other people's culture, belief system and the institutions that we set up for justice, child welfare and health care are broken and racist. These are hard things to hear. They make us uncomfortable. They make us want to explain, justify, or deny. Let us sit in that discomfort. Let us pray. God of justice, we are guilty of building tables. We, we have built tables, tables that oppression dies on, sexism thrives on, and racism lives on. God of justice, we are guilty of forgetting where we are, of, of turning faith into a negotiation tool, and, and the church into a place for insiders. God of justice, we are guilty of ignoring the point. For you taught that the temple was for worship, and your message was for all. God of our hearts, be in our decision making. Draw near to our choices. Forgive our mistakes. And as you do, flip every table, habit, belief, or point of view that needs adjusting. With hope we pray for a better day. Amen. Family of faith, the good news is that God took on flesh and walked this earth to show us the way. God took on flesh so that we could see what it looks like to disrupt and overturn systems of corruption. God took on flesh to teach us another way. God took on flesh to point us to restoration. God took on flesh so that we might be forgiven. Friends, we are held, loved, and forgiven by a just and merciful God. Thanks be to God for a love like that.
The message about the cross doesn't make any sense to lost people. But for those of us who are being saved, it is God's power at work. As God says in the scriptures, I will destroy the wisdom of all who claim to be wise. I will confuse those who think they know so much. What happened to those wise people? What happened to those experts in the scriptures? What happened to the ones who think they have all the answers? Didn't God show that the wisdom of this world is foolish? God was wise and decided not to let the people of this world use their wisdom to learn about him. Instead, God chose to save only those who believe the foolish message we preach. Jews ask for miracles, and Greeks want something that sounds wise. But we preach that Christ was nailed to a cross. Most Jews have problems with this, and most Gentiles think it's foolish. Our message is God's power and wisdom for the Jews and the Greeks that he has chosen. Even when God is foolish, he is wiser than everyone else. And even when God is weak, he is stronger than everyone else. Our Lent theme is again and again. And our symbol is the ampersand, or the and symbol. It's a symbol of God's holy and. And it's symbolic that there is more. We're broken and beautiful. And both joy and grief coexist together. Yes, historical systemic oppression persists. And God is always, though, guiding us closer to liberation and wholeness. Like the disciples, we're often stuck in a pattern of messing up over and over again. We cling to power, we climb the ladder, and we memorialize Jesus, and we commoditize God's teachings rather than embodying them. We can feel trapped by shame, guilt, ignorance or inaction. But Jesus freed us from all of that on the cross, and in humility we are transformed by God's Holy Spirit. Again and again we are called to listen to God and to others. We are called to come and see. God shows us the way. Not long before the Jewish festival of Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. There he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves in the temple. He also saw money changers sitting at their tables. So he took some rope and made a whip. Then he chased everyone out of the temple, together with their sheep and cattle. He turned over the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. Jesus said to the people who had been selling doves, Get those doves out of here. Don't make my father's house a marketplace. The disciples then remembered that the scriptures say, My love for your house burns in me like a fire. The Jewish leaders asked Jesus, What miracle will you work to show us why you have done this? Destroy this temple, Jesus answered, and in three days I will build it again. The leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think you can rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as a temple. And when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered what he had told them, and they believed the scriptures and the words of Jesus. Let me give you the context of the Gospel reading which we've just heard Mark read to us. John has been baptising in the desert. And he's directing the disciples there towards Jesus because he has just seen the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus. He knows that he is God's anointed one. He is God's chosen. Jesus then calls some disciples to come, to come and see. And three days later in Cana, Jesus turns some water into wine in his first miracle. And we're shortly after that. After that, Jesus has gone to the temple. Uh, John says this, Not long before the Jewish festival of Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. Right at the beginning, John frames Jesus' ministry 
with two things that we are constantly to come and see. The first are the miracles. The miracles point to the fact that Jesus is from God the Father. This is really critically important to John. And the second is that real change is needed. Some of that change that is needed is within Jesus' established faith, within the Jewish faith. And that's why we see Jesus overturn the tables in today's reading. So why did he turn the tables over? What got him so worked up? Well, first of all, you need to understand God's work with the Jewish people. Have you heard of cascading before? Cascading is where if you tell someone, um, if you tell two people something, and they go and tell another two, and they tell another two, and they tell another two, the number grows pretty quickly. We move from 6 to 14 to 30 to 60 to 120 to 240 to 480 to 900. The number grows really quickly as we cascade. Growth happens. And God's plan was that something similar would happen with Israel. Israel would fulfill a key role in calling all people to God. From that chosen group of people, they would cascade God's message out to others, and they would tell it to others, and to others, and to others, so that all people would be drawn to God. Uh, Jerusalem would have the holy temple. It would be a light for all people, drawing all people to God. And the thing with drawing all people to God is that there will be some who are different. There will be some who hold a different faith, or maybe no faith at all, or who have never heard of Jerusalem's faith. So God's plan was that all people would be drawn to God. And in God's temple, there would be two parts. There would be a part for those who already participate in the faith, and there would be another part for those who were still exploring the faith. Now the temple was cut roughly evenly in half. There was half for those exploring the faith, and half for those who already had faith. This was God's plan, that Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple would draw all people to God. And right at the beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus goes to the temple. Now, he didn't go to some rural or urban synagogue or church. It wasn't a small little church like St. Mary by the Sea. He went to the big temple. It was our equivalent of a cathedral. Now Jerusalem was a city on a hill, and the temple was massive. Cities on a hill can be seen from a long way away, and the temple, it could be seen from even further away. It was there to draw all people to God. And Jesus turns up. You know what? There's no room for visitors. The space for visitors is chock-a-block with commerce. Um, has been turned into something of a pack and save or countdown or new world. And the real crime was that their religion had been turned into a way to make money and to profit from people's insecurities. When you came to the temple, you were required to offer sacrifices, which in and of itself wasn't a problem. Rather, the problem lay in the system. First of all, you had to change your secular money to religious currency. You were only able to use religious currency in the temple. Now, why might you want to use religious currency in the temple? Well, it turns out that you weren't able to bring your own sacrifice. You couldn't bring your own cow or sheep or dove or grain offering or olive oil. Rather, you had to buy the temple sacrifices. So you had to change, change your money and you lost something there as the temple took a cut of that money. And then you had to buy their sacrifices at their prices. There was no competition. So you used the temple money, you bought the sacrifice, and it was a system that, while set up originally for good and purposes, today just served as a racket. And what's worse, that system of changing money that system of buying all of those sacrifices took up the Gentile area. It took up the room that God said was to draw all people to God. That 
area dedicated to calling people to God had been turned into commerce. It wasn't for God at all. There were mixed messages going out. So Jesus clears that area out. And John says this, The disciples then remembered what the scripture said, My love for your house burns in me like a fire. The disciples remembered the purpose of the temple. It's a place of passion, a place of connection, a place of renewal, a place where all can be. In this story, Jesus turns over the tables of our expectations. He flips the tables of commerce. He calls us back to the heart of what we're called to. So we reflect what's flipped in our own lives. What has stalled to flip over? Lent is a time of cleansing, a time of rediscovering God's path for us. You know, we all get it wrong. And it's never too late to turn back. Jesus says, come, come and see. He shows the disciples the corruption that exists in the system. And he sets about fixing it so that ultimately all can experience God's love. Just not the chosen few. It's not for just the chosen few. It's for all so that all can experience God's love. And that required the flipping of the tables of our expectations. Or what Paul might call the foolishness of God in the Corinthians reading. Uh, Paul quotes Isaiah 29.14 and it says this. So once again I will do things that shock and amaze them. And I will destroy the wisdom of those who claim to know and to understand. We've certainly seen that with Jesus in today's reading, haven't we? Where the establishment's understanding is flipped over. In humility, we need to be ready to receive correction, to receive redirection. Some things might feel foolish. Maybe they might be a bit countercultural. Maybe they might be disruptive. Maybe they might be uncomfortable. But that's the way of Jesus who we follow. Or as we say in our communion service, we are called to suffer, give us hope in our calling. So where is it today that you see oppression? Where is it that you see something that was set up for good that is now instead oppressing? May Lent give you clarity into your own life and the life lived around you. And as you come to see Jesus' work in the world, may you likewise work for peace, freedom and justice. Amen. We often say we should leave the past behind us, but sometimes in order to do that, we have to go back to move forward. Can you think of something that you used to think or believe or even do that you have let go of? Something you know now is wrong. Maybe it was a belief that your grandparents or parents had that you no longer believe. Maybe it was something told as fact that was found not to be true. In society, there are different beliefs that have been held over time. Eugenics, slavery, the benefits of smoking that we know now to be not true. In our homes, there can be trauma or damage that we need healing from before we are free to be the people we are meant to be. Jesus clearing the temple was telling the people, this way you have been behaving, preventing people from accessing temple, selling and buying and making, making profit out of people's religious worship was wrong. It's okay to admit that we've got it wrong and it's never too late to change. Last week, we call, talked about the call we have to listen to one another. And this is the next step in the transformative process of faith and relationship with God. Once we listen, once we know that what we did or believe was wrong or harmful, we can come to God for transformation and healing. 
we will spend a few moments in silence, praying to God for the transformational healing of our mistaken and wrong beliefs. This week, I encourage you to spend some time with God to help you move through the process of both confessing and healing and moving forward. Let us pray. We are gathered spiritually as believers united through Jesus Christ, whose mighty name we pray. Almighty Father, we pray that your church will faithfully advance the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. May the church, by its love for God, show forth the truth of the gospel through transformed lives. God of love, we pray for all who are in need. May we generously share with others as any have need. Lord, you make a way when there is no way. We pray that you continue to work miracles in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our families and friends. We pray for church leaders and all people in need of Jesus again and again, who offers salvation to sinners and life eternal to all who accept him and follow in his way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are our way maker and we offer our prayers for lives that are going through distress caused by the pandemic and lockdown and in circumstances which only you can change. We pray for all our children this Sunday as we uh, celebrate children, especially with the many challenges they face, that your light guide them always. May, May we rejoice, rejoice and be glad in God's, God's unfailing love that endures forever. Leotuai, we pray for St. Mary by the sea, Dion, Angela and children, our church family, especially the elderly, that you protect us and bless us in the miracles you perform in our daily lives. May, May we rejoice, rejoice and be glad in God's steadfast love that endures forever. Faithful God, we pray for ourselves that we may know the Lord through the reading of scripture and prayer. And may we witness your spirit working inside our hearts. Merciful Father, accept these prayers in the name of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. No matter to ma o ilelani, ia pa ia lo suafa, ia o mai lo ma lo, ia faia lo finanga lo ilelani e pei o na faia ilelani, ia e fua i mai ia te i ma tau le a sonei, o a ma tau mea ai te tau ma le a so. I a e fa ma ngalo i a te i mātou, i a mātou a nga sala. E pei o na mātou whoi o na mātou fa ma ngalo i nātou, i e wāngale a nga mai i a te i mātou. A wa whoi le te i te ina i mātou le fa o sosonga. A i a lawe a i a i mātou a i le leanga. A wa e o le mā lō ma le mana. A tō ma le vi i nga e fa o vā o lava. Amen.
As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer and Giver of life, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Amen.